Welcome to the Poetry Box Live. I'm Sean Evaninga Sanders, and we're so happy that you could join us today. For those of you who may be turning in, tuning in for the very first time, my husband Robert and I run an independent press here in Portland, Oregon, known as the Poetry Box. And to help support our authors reach a bigger audience, we host the Poetry Box Live on the second Saturday of each month. And for today's show, we are very excited to welcome two talented poets who have written new books of poetry for children. Today's featured poets include Debbie Hall, who will be sharing poems and photos from her new book, In the Jaguar's House, and Pamela Anderson Bartholet, who will be reading poems from her book, The Galloping Garbage Truck. So let's get started with our very first reader. When Debbie Hall was a child, she dreamed of going on an African safari someday. And in the past 10 years, she has done just that, three times in fact. She's also been lucky enough to photograph wild animals in various countries throughout the world. And since photography and poetry are her twin passions, she's very excited to share her animal poems and photos from her new book with you today. So if you're all ready, let's welcome Debbie Hall as she takes us in the Jaguar's house. Hello everyone. And I will try not to make this transition too painful here. And there we go. What do you know, it worked. Um, first off, I just wanna give a big thank you to Sean Abeningo Sanders and Robert Sanders for the fabulous job they did on this book. Um, you can see Robert's work here on the cover. I just love it. Um, and I want to thank all of you for being here as well. Friends I didn't expect to see. I'm just delighted to see here. So it really makes a huge difference. Um, and I'm just going to go out of this gallery view because I'd love, love to see you all, but I got to see the poem. So I'm going to start by reading the title poem of the book, and it's called In the Jaguar's House. And I'm probably going to repeat myself as we go through saying, what a thrill it was to see all these animals and it certainly was true every time. So let's start with this one in the Jaguar's house. We have entered the Jaguar's house. He, his house has a ceiling made of sky, floors of earth, corridors of rivers and streams. We enter his world quietly, so not to disrupt his daily business. He watches us watching him, then plunges back into pale green water to catch a plump capybara for his midday meal. And if you've never seen a capybara, if you're wondering about the, the creature that got to be a meal, um, they're, think about a hundred pound guinea pig and you'll kind of have an idea of what, what a capybara is. Okay, this next poem is called Toucan and Dove. And um, I really modeled it on a, on, a, on a poem called Ostrich and Lark by a very famous and wonderful poet named Marilyn Nelson. Toucan and Dove met each morning on the same branch of the same tree. This pleased the visitors who came to take their pictures. Toucan was a bit flashy with the bright light of her immense beak and other bold colors. She enjoyed looking the photographer straight in the eye. Dove was feathered in soft grays and browns his beak tiny compared to toucans. He looked away shyly from all the visitors, bedazzled by the amazing toucan. People often missed the quiet message Dove sent them until they went home and looked at their pictures. They almost missed the shape of his folded wings, his generous heart. And some of you who are really good eagle eyes might note that this is actually a pigeon in the picture. But as it turns out, doves and pigeons are part of the same family, literally being like cousins. Okay, so the title of this poem is um, Laughing Otter. And many of us just love seeing in North America, river otters and the otters in the ocean and note how cute they are and everything. And th these otters are cute too, but I might tell you that they can get up, it's a giant river otter that can get up to six feet in length. So it's pretty amazing to see them swimming alongside your boat in the river or watching them laughing like this one seems to be doing um, or, or eating fish and catching fish. Okay, so laughing otter. I laugh, you laugh, we laugh, guffaw, howl, chortle, 
snicker, shriek, giggle, whoop, snort until water shoots out of our noses. <laughs> Nobody's had that happen, right? Having water shoot out your nose. I know you have. Well, this uh, cute little owl is called a mottled owl. And we were very lucky um, to see this at night. And I tell you, it's just thrilling to go looking for birds, especially in other animals at night when it's really, you don't know if you're going to see them or not. And it's really a gift when you do. And these owls have incredible vision that allows them to hunt prey. Night seer, her deep, dark saucer eyes scan the world around her, open up the night with her superb vision. When she sees the brush below, shudder with small light, she swoops down on silent wings, ready to snatch her prey in sharp talons. Run, lizards, run. Poor lizards. Okay, more cats. This is an ocelot, and ocelots have just gorgeous fur and very fine fur, which makes them vulnerable um, to the illegal wildlife trade. We were lucky enough to see this cat at night in Brazil, um, and the people viewing the cat were behind a blind. Um, unfortunately for us photographers, they had a light shining on the cat who uh, came out to eat some food that was placed there for it. So this is called, Who Goes There? Child, are you friend or foe? I need to know. I've come out from under my leafy canopy to better see you. A gorgeous cat like me can't be too careful. Some people want to take my very fine fur to make into a coat. Others might want to capture me and sell me as a pet. If this happened, my happiness would die. You understand, don't you? Yes, you are a friend and will not harm me. I'll go back now into the night and remember you fondly. You know, who doesn't love a sloth? You know, it's interesting to me after we saw sloths in Costa Rica, but I kept seeing stuffed sloths and things like that in, in stores and in gift stores. And they seem to have become rather popular in that way. Um, and they are the slowest mammal on the planet. Um, and one of the things that's fun, besides just seeing them up high in the trees, is to see one coming down from the tree. So imagine somebody moving in extreme slow motion, and that's how a sloth moves. So this uh, poem is called Slow Mo. I'm the slowest mammal on the planet. No rush, no worry for leisurely me. High up in the treetops, drowsy and dreamy, hanging upside down for as long as I please. I grow a fine green coat to match my canopy of leaves. And so sloths move so slowly that algae actually grows on their coat. And that's why they have that lovely shade of green. So another big thrill is going to parts of the world where we can see um, incredibly colored and feathered hummingbirds. And as you know, probably hummingbirds are very tiny birds. And so it seemed to me that uh, a poem should be a little, a poem for a hummingbird should be a little poem. And so that's why I wrote a haiku. Haiku for a hummingbird. What colors you wear now that you have flirted with a passing rainbow. And these are, I might add too, that hummingbirds, besides just being amazing and how they move around and, um, their, their colors and their feathers. It's they most, the average weight of a hummingbird is the weight of a nickel. So kind of an incredible thing to think about. Okay, I'm gonna move, there we go. This is a capuchin monkey. Um, and some of us uh, elders remember the movies when sometimes they would show an organ grinder with a monkey and this, is that type of monkey that was shown in that movie. And they're very intelligent animals um, and they have 
historically served humans in many ways, but we really know that they don't belong serving humans, but belong back in the rainforest in their home with their families. So this is called Dear Capuchin Monkeys. Thank you for being with us humans. The organ grinders, thank you, little performers. Movie makers, thank you, little actors. Greyhound racers, thank you, little jockeys. Scientists, thank you for your service. Your human companions, thank you for your love. But now the rainforests and your families need you. Return to the wild now, capuchin monkeys, and nestle safely in the arms of your favorite trees. Love one who admires you. Okay. I might say who doesn't love a lizard, but I think a lot of people aren't keen on lizards, but I find them fascinating. And we have a lot here in Southern California, especially during the hot weather that we've been having, and they run all over the patio, but they're much smaller than the lizard that you see before you, which is a green iguana. Um, and they're kind of, they almost look prehistoric to some people or look like dragons. Um, and it's interesting to watch them. Sometimes you'll be on a river and they're up in a branch and just kind of draped over the branch and over the river. And it's really fun to spot them. And they actually, sometimes when they sleep, they'll sleep together um, draped over each other. So that would be great to see as well. Iguana. I have seen an immense lizard high in a canopy of trees, marbled at its crest of dragon-like spines, craggy head, it's droopy dewlap, a chin flap that might be saying, hello, or stay away, this is mine. It's pebbled and studded skin. I will call this creature a wonderment, this most splendid lizard called iguana. Mm. How's the pace? Is this, am I going too fast or is this working okay? All right, good. All right, there are a number of members of the animal kingdom, of course, that can be immensely entertaining. And macaws are no exception. And I'm sure many of you have seen macaws, different kinds of macaws in zoos or even in uh, people that have macaws as pets. Um, and we were in, uh, so lucky to see these guys um, in Brazil, I believe. And they literally were out, right outside our window. We were saying, gee, I hope they come to the trees so we can see these beautiful um, birds. And they are not quiet by any mean. So this poem is called A Raucous Caucus of Macaws. They swoop down onto a tree outside our window and shout, wake up, wake up. Blindingly beautiful, brilliant and blue. They screech, we're here, we're here. They flutter their feathers, flitter about, chatter and squawk, who are you, who are you? Fabulously friendly, fun to a fault. They woo us and whistle. Let's be friends, let's be friends. <laughs> Great birds. Now, many of us associate um, penguins with snow and ice. And certainly when you're in Ar Antarctica, you see lots of penguins on the ice. But in South Africa, there uh, is a much smaller penguin that obviously lives in warmer weather. And um, they're just delightful to watch, again, endlessly entertaining. So this is called, Who's That Following Me? A strange looking bird is following me. He's flat and gray and a little see-through. He flaps his wings whenever I do. What type of bird could this be? At night, he disappears into the dark. When sunlight arrives, so does he. He looks a bit thin, my odd looking friend. Perhaps I should feed him some fish. I guess I don't mind him following me, but could you please help me with this? What type of bird could this be? Oh, you know what I forgot to do was move myself here so we can see the poem. There we go. Well, I tell you, I, I'm gonna say this again, the thrill, there's nothing more thrilling than, which is true for seeing so many of these gorgeous creatures. But being in a um, Jeep in Africa and coming upon a herd of about 100 elephants 
is just mind boggling and wonderful. And elephants are favorites of many people, I think, as far as animals, perhaps in part because they're very social and they form close bonds with their family members. Um, and they weigh, as adults, they can weigh anywhere from two and a half to seven tons. So th that's impressive. So this little poem for the African elephants is called Mighty Me. I come from a mighty herd. When we walk across the land, you'll hear a mighty sound, the trumpeting of magnificent elephants on the move, mighty feet kicking up clouds of dirt, mighty trunks swaying, mighty ears waving. I am little now, but already growing mightily, mighty, mighty me. You know, one of the things I enjoy, this picture was actually taken at our San Diego uh, Zoo Safari Park, formerly known as the Wild Animal Park. Um, but I really enjoy watching gorillas and just looking at their expressions and kind of wondering what they're thinking about us. And we share 98% of our genes with gorillas. So I thought it was interesting to have that in mind, only from the opposite viewpoint about our human relatives. Young one, I know the human animals over there look a bit strange. They have so little fur on their bodies. Some of them wear colors as loud as a peacock. It is hard to believe we are related to these creatures. There are visitors who watch us with kindness in your eyes, but some are impolite, pointing, yelling at us and making strange faces. They are likely the less intelligent of their species. <laughs> and who doesn't love a zebra? Zebras um, are members of the horse family and they also, interestingly, no two zebras have the same stripe pattern. So they can actually be identified by their unique stripe pattern just like humans can be identified by their fingerprints. And I have way too many pictures of zebras just because they're just so captivating. Zebras, they're a riot of stripes and oodles of fun. When you see them together, you'll never know where one has ended and the other begun. Okay, the king of beasts, so to speak. This lion was photographed in South Africa. And lions are um, the second largest of the cat family. Um, jaguars are the third and tigers are the first. But the African lion's roar can be heard from up to five miles away. And I will tell you, having camped uh, in a row of tents or in a tent on the Serengeti, it's pretty exciting to hear a lion roaring at night and wondering how close they really are, okay? Um, but a wonderful experience. So this is called, It's Not Easy Being King. Panthera Leo is my fancy name, but you know me as lion, king of beasts or king of the jungle. Well, I do not live in a jungle and I'm not always sure I want to be king. Oh yes, I stand proud and have a glorious mane. My roar is loud, fierce and commanding. I am the envy of many. Small prey scurry away whenever they see me. But sometimes I'd like to be a monkey swinging high in a tree, a sweet nightingale or a zebra prancing its dizzying stripes. A lion can dream, can't he? After all, it's not always easy being king. I wonder how many people in our audience would count lions as their favorite animal or one of their favorites, I'm certain they would. Now, there might not be as many fans of the GNU, I'm pronouncing it GNU here. Uh, it's really pronounced NU or it's also called a wildebeest. And even though GNUs, news are somewhat interesting or funny looking to some people, they really are part of a spectacle um, on the Serengeti 
that is a bucket list experience and uh, up to one and a half million um, migrate. And they're often seen with zebras. So this is from the voice of the GNU. Mr. GNU to you, I'm not your average looking antelope. Some say I am not properly built. I say, by whose standards? My front end is heavy, my hindquarters slight, my head is shaped like a rectangle. I call this interesting. I carry this heavy body on spindly legs. Some refer to me as ungainly. I say, watch me thunder across the plains. I'm not your average looking antelope. You need not call me handsome, but you may call me amazing. We still doing okay on time, Sean? Great, okay. Now this beauty is a very young giraffe and this was actually taken at the San Diego Zoo, our world famous and wonderful zoo uh, here down in SoCal. Um, and I was lucky enough to be there on a day where there was wonderful viewing of this young giraffe. And giraffe are the tallest living animals. I mean, they can see in a second story window without straining. Um, and one of the fun facts that kids will find in the back of the book is that a giraffe, when giraffes are adults, their neck weighs 600 pounds, which kind of blew me away. So this poem is called, If I Come Back to Life as a Different Animal. If I come back to life as a different animal, I'd surely like to be a giraffe. So tall, I could touch the clouds with my head, glide like a slow wave as I stride across the plains resembling royalty. Gaze at all the smaller creatures underneath me with a gentle love. Thank you, Rebecca. <laughs> okay. There we go. Okay. Now, this is a type of monkey called a langur monkey, and we saw them in India. And they are a monkey I could watch all day long. They're fairly common in public spaces in India. Um, and as you can see from these two pictures, they are quite entertaining. And they get fairly close, which is wonderful for photographers. The tonka is another Japanese poetry form like haiku. And so this pair are called tonkas for two monkeys. One, monkey's eyes grow big. Mouth wide open in surprise. What is she watching? I hope it is a tiger. If so, she'll run away soon. Two, what's lost is lost. A monkey looked all over. Wait, nothing is lost. This monkey admires himself in a mirror of water. <laughs> okay. Now, as we're all aware, I think the polar bear has really become kind of the symbol of um, one of the symbols of climate change and global warming because of what it's done to its habitat and continues to do. Um, and my partner and I were lucky enough to get to travel up to Churchill, Canada uh, to see the polar bears, uh, another thrill. And this poem is called A Bear of Many Names. Ursus Maritimus, the Larctos, sea bear, ice bear, Nanook, Isbjorn, white bear, belly medved, lord of the Arctic, old man in the fur cloak or white sea deer. This bear is built for the cold. This bear calls the sea ice home, but his home is shrinking as the world is warming too much. Imagine your house and all the other houses around you shrinking so much that only a mouse could live in your house. This bear needs you and me to help save his home. This bear of many names never wants to be called ghost bear. And I'm gonna end with the, actually is also the last poem in the book. And as we all know, I think um, no matter where you are, some of the most amazing sightings come in our own backyards. Um, this was a red dragonfly and often see red dragonflies around our fish pond in the summer. And they are again among 
many of the amazing creatures. They can fly straight up and down like a helicopter. Um, and they have uh, more eyes than we do. And they also, by the way, I didn't know this um, before, they serve us humans by eating a lot of mosquitoes. So all of you who suffer from uh, insects, especially in the summer, I know my friends Kate and Sandy in Minnesota uh, have to put up with insects in the summer. We're kind of spoiled here in, in California, or at least down here, where we don't really suffer insects so much. And I know when I go visit friends in other places, it's like, oh, what's this? And it's also true of traveling the world that you really need to take your repellent with you. But aside from that, red dragonfly. She comes to the pond in the heat of summer, wraps her forelegs around a, blind, uh, a plant stem and rests over water bubbling with orange koi. Her wings are clear like windows with dozens of tiny panes. If you look through them, you may see a kaleidoscope of colors, the silk thread of a spider's web or a feather drifting by. If you invite her back in your most sincere voice, she might gift you with her return. And I just wanna add one more thing that, um, you know, so many animals are in danger in the world either endangered or critically endangered um, due to climate change and other factors such as habitat loss and the wildlife trade. Um, but the good news, and I say this especially to the kids in the audience, is that all of us, but kids especially, can help and can make a big difference in what happens um, to all these animals, to the earth and all of its inhabitants. So in the book, there's a number of resources for you to figure out how to get on board with helping everyone. So thank you very much for listening and watching. I enjoyed it. Thank you, Debbie. That was so much fun. I, I love all these animals and, and learning about them and your pictures are gorgeous. And I try to pick a favorite, but I just, I just can't seem to pick one, but I, I did get a kick out of the sloth and that the, the algae grows on them. That was kind of crazy. <laughs> I've never heard of that before. So anyway, thank you so much for that fun, fun book. Okay, are you ready? Our next reader is Pamela Anderson Barthelay, who is the author of The Galloping Garbage Truck. Pam is the author of two other poetry books, Just the Girls, A Kaleidoscope of Butterflies, A Drift of Honeybees, Honeybees and <laughs> Widowmaker. She was formerly a public radio, radio fundraiser and hit the jackpot when she retired and began to channel her energies into hiking, yoga, writing, and reading. And of course, waving to all the garbage trucks galloping down her street. So please welcome Pamela Anderson Barthelay. Hi, everybody. Um, it's great to see everyone here. Thanks for coming. Um, Debbie's book, which I have so thoroughly enjoyed. Thank you, Debbie. That was great. And thanks to Sean and Robert in the Poetry Box for hosting this today. Um, really glad to be here. I'm glad to see Daniel and Peter and Emma. And I know Ada is on the call. So this is great to have you here. Um, just last week, I was reading to Daniel and Peter. So um, yeah, here's my book, The Galloping Garbage Truck. Um, and I'm going to start with the first poem in it, um, Buttons. Matching buttons down my front, from neck to waist, they stitch me up. But wondering I'm prone to do about the need to twin times two. Why do my buttons have to match? Why can't I have a mismatched batch? Well, who says it's always good and right to stick with discs of black or white? And does it really matter size-wise if we can buttonhole and resize? Don't get me started on the collar of my shirt or coat or sweater. I think that they could also gain from changes in my style and then some. Let's trade things out in lots of ways. Let's mix and match and celebrate how different things make life more fun. Let's start with buttons one by one. So I wrote this book, thanks, um, in the, a lot of it during the pandemic and a lot of it um, while 
we were in Charlotte with our grandsons. Um, so I did a lot of walking and thinking as I wrote these. Um, and I thought a lot about my feet because I was hiking a lot in different shoes. And I thought I would write a little poem that was, oh, there's my book, <laughs> that was an ode to my feet. And it's called My Two Dogs. I have two dogs. They bark at me. They make a fearsome racket. They howl and yowl incessantly until I stop to pat them. They settle down, these grouchy mates, while I resume my hustle. I spring, I dash, I dart, I skate, which takes a bit of hustle. And that in turn leads to their growls and bids for more attention. I tell them, stop your caterwaul, you're adding to my tension. When darkness falls, I take a rest and sink into my rocker. I lean far back, my dogs at last, stretched out, toes up, no squawking. So as we, um, my husband and I, Al and I traveled from uh, North Carolina and back to Ohio, where we're here for the rest of the year, one of the things that um, we notice is the proliferation of raccoons on our lake. They just are sort of everywhere, um, prancing across the deck and sliding under the deck. And so raccoons are kind of part of the life, life here on the lake, along with geese and um, cranes and an eagle and so on. But the raccoons are really troublesome. But I wanted to give just a different kind of thought about raccoons with this next poem called Could We Be Friends? My fuzzy kitten crouches down with impish eyes a glitter. She sheathes her claws beneath soft paws while speaking with a chitter. I wonder what she sees outside to make her so excited. I press my chin against the pane and outward shine my flashlight. Imagine my surprise when I see luminescent glowing from two red orbs within whose form a black masked face is showing. Raccoon, I whisper to my cat, while trembling she continues. The small raccoon, herself a cub, creeps closer to the window. It reaches out to touch the glass while my cat noses forward. With some concern, I hesitate as these two kittens ponder the eyes and mouths and ears and paws an almost mirror image. Could we be friends? They seem to ask. Let's try. It takes a village. So um, my personal favorite in this collection is the girl with the bow in her hair. And I don't know if you can see the illustration. Can you see that? This is the girl, the bow in her hair which uh, my daughter Liza created all of the images in this book as well as the cover. And she and I are working on a sequel to The Girl with the Bow in Her Hair. I've written the copy for it now and my daughter's doing all the illustrating for it because I just thought this girl was so much fun. She's got sassy and, and, uh, and she's, she's pretty smart, pretty smart girl. The Girl with the Bow in Her Hair. I rise every morning, my head full of hair that's tangled and mangled and making me scared. My brush and my comb are both frightened too at the thought of the job we know we must do. We stand at the mirror, my brush comb and me, and we stare at my hair as it tries to break free from the place where it lives on the top of my head as it gives not a thought to cute stylings instead. I take a deep breath, put on my fierce face, the one that I save for occasions like this. Then I lift up my hands, place both on my pelt and I smooth and I coax till resolve starts to melt. Why bother with taming this wild silly hairdo when every new day it turns into a corkscrew? Then suddenly 
I have a brilliant idea of something that maybe can fix my dilemma. I run to the closet to find the big box that's filled to the brim with gift wrapping stuff. Inside is a bow that's intended to grace, a present for someone who now is unnamed. I rummage around till I find a red bow, plop it onto my hair till it nestles just so. I look in the mirror and grin back at me. All that hair, big red bow, I am loverly. So um, my grandsons love kale salad. My one grandson does not love asparagus, but this next poem, Kale Salad, deals with eating and um, what we like and don't like in food, kale salad. I love kale salad, yes I do. I love the way it sticks like glue to mashed potatoes on my plate. I swirl them up, they taste so great. Avocados also are my go-to treats when I am hungry, smashed on toast or served up plain. They're green, they're good, they feed my brain. Don't get me started praising beets. To me, they are a favorite treat. And what of broccoli, okra, carrots? In soup or stew, they all have merit. I only draw a line on veggies with one food that makes me edgy. That's asparagus. It's true. It makes me shudder when I chew. But for the rest, please serve them up. I'll try and taste. They're all good grub. During the pandemic, especially, I was practicing yoga a lot via Zoom. I'm so happy that we have Zoom for things like poetry readings and, and yoga. But um, my one grandson, well, really both of them, love to practice yoga with me. So that's what inspired this poem, practicing yoga. I'm a volcano, a waterfall too, when I'm practicing yoga in my living room. Now I'm a crane, see me reach up so high, a stork, then an eagle, I take a swan dive. Animals wild, I compose with my body. Look at me, I'm a bear and I breathe like a lion. Domesticate animals are nothing new when I am a cat or a dog or a moo. When I want to slow down, I crouch into rabbit or grab my two feet. Happy babies, my gambit. I choose what I want when I practice my yoga. It's good for all children. Come, join me in Cobra. Well, we came back uh, from beautiful, sunshiny, warm North Carolina to Ohio where it was snowy today. And that seems like um, perfect reason to read uh, Murky, which is about our favorite weather person here in Ohio, Betsy Kling on WKYC. And I wrote this uh, really about her, Murky. The weather girl stands inside the TV forecasting unstoppable weather. Murky today and tomorrow, she says, will be drizzly and drear beyond measure. I think I might cry at her cheeky bright smile and predictions of gloomy horizons. Give me sunshine instead and warm temps overhead. That's my prayer for a change in the season. Still, I'm stuck in the muck of this nor'easter rut of dim days that bring dank, drenching rainfall. I must weather this weather from inside my house, reading books, drinking tea, wearing sweaters. Um, I'll just read one more. It's the title poem, The Galloping Garbage Truck, um, which, I don't know, garbage trucks are such favorite um, trucks for us to watch go by. I mean, I think Daniel and Peter would say that. They love to see the garbage truck going by. And, um, and that's, that's this poem, The Galloping Garbage Truck. The galloping garbage truck rumbles along at a pace that is truly alarming. It zooms down the road, passing only at curves in a dash for the trash with no warnings. 
I wait for the truck on my perch where the view gives a perfect perspective for watching as it drives house to house, announcing itself with a burp, then a blare and a coughing. The sounds make me laugh and the binman I see gives a nod when I smile his direction. As he dumps all our stuff in the back of the truck, I clap loud and he grins with affection. Though no words do we share, we're a well-suited pair, the lorryman and his admirer. I can picture my march to the green machine's perch, taking charge, steering far as the driver. My parents have other ideas for me. Transportation is one of their visions. I could pilot a plane, engineering the same. Astronaut, build a yacht, my decision. But for now, I'm content to salute my new friend every Tuesday when he comes a calling. We smile, wave, and laugh over everyone's trash. It's a job. He works hard. I'm applauding. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. And thanks again, Sean, Robert, and Debbie, too. Oh, Pam, that was so much fun. Oh, just delightful little stories and all oh, with such a wonderful, good message for all of us. And I have to say, I'm very much looking forward to the future adventures of the girl with the bow in her hair. <laughs> I used to always wear a bow on my hair and I like to think I was a little sassy too. <laughs> so that's going to be a really fun book. I really look forward to it. So let's have a giant round of applause for all of our readers today. Yay. And thank you to our audience for joining us for our very special kids edition of the Poetry Box Live. I hope everyone had fun today. I know I did. For next month's show on May 14th, we'll be back to our usual format and time of 4 p.m. Pacific and 7 p.m. Eastern. And our three featured poets will be Nathan Fryback, author of Shells in the Sieve, Tara Carnes, author of Built to Last, and John Miller, author of Olympic. So to keep up on upcoming shows, new releases, and submission opportunities, please subscribe to our newsletter by going to thepoetrybox.com, where you'll find a sign-up form at the bottom of each webpage. So thanks again for joining us today. We look forward to sharing more poetry with you next month on The Poetry Box Live. Looks like Emma had a special animal that she was oh, holding right. during the reading. Yeah. Is that a giraffe? That's her favorite animal. Oh, oh <laughs> I love giraffes. <laughs> oh. That was such fun. Both authors, all the poems, I loved it. <laughs>